got another solo dolo episode for y'all here. Um, I meant when I said, I meant it when I said that I was gonna start doing these more often. Maybe I'm gonna take the, I'm gonna take my glasses off because people have told me that the ring light shining through all my lenses is kind of distracting or slash annoying. Now, but now these hairs from my bird nest ass haircut is getting in my, in my face and it's annoying me. But you know, we'll make do with what we got. Late at night here, it's a Friday night, the night I'm recording this. So tired. Um, had a hell of a day today. Did a little bit of a double workout, hit up uh, some chest and back, and then did a jujitsu class that I did not expect to be that difficult because it was meant for all levels. And I don't know what's going on, but lately they're emphasizing more, I guess, and this is a good thing, like realistic training. So if it starts on the feet, the guy's trying to swing at you, know how to block, time in your takedowns, and yada, yada, yada. Um, towards the end of it, we did live training, so that's rounds of basically sparring for those who are not initiated in the practices of jiu-jitsu. But yeah, it's just basically where you're like sparring against another person, going pretty hard, trying to get submissions, um, kind of like just full-blown going at it. And it fucking drains you like nothing else, I swear to God. It was one five- or six-minute round of live training and then beforehand there was like a, a little bit of a situational training or like light sparring but one heavy round of you know whatever live training and that shit gets your you have to literally pace yourself because if you go and just try to pass his like let's say you're on top and you try to pass all these positions your gas tank just burns through so fast especially me like i'm not particularly um super i don't have a high level of endurance gotta get that vo2 max up but 100% uh, tiring, 100% stress relieving because now afterwards you feel light as a fucking feather because you're so goddamn tuckered out from doing all that heavy activity. But yeah, I got an interesting, we got an interesting episode today. I got an interesting episode. Um, going to talk about a fa tour, fa tour that I recently did in New York City with some really co close friends of mine. And then we're going to just probably wrap up the episode talking about Tom Segura performing at Mohegan and, and a little stuff like that. So let's let's jump straight into the FUD tour because this is something I was super excited to talk um, to y'all about. I've gotten a couple new subscribers, so I'm, I think I'm at like 190 something right now at the time of this recording. Again, super appreciative for all of y'all. Pho is an interesting food. Um, it is, in my opinion, the ultimate hangover cure. You know, a lot of people say they like greasy shit. And I don't know if I'm a fan of, of, of grease for, for curing a hangover. I have a sensitive stomach. Me personally, I have a sensitive stomach when it comes to like oily foods, greasy foods, stuff like that. So, oh, hold on. This fucking cat. There we go. I have a sensitive stomach when it comes to like super oily things or super greasy things. So, and typically when I'm hungover, the first thing that I feel or the biggest symptom is just like the core, like, you know, my belly is not feeling right. It just feels super acidic, like I've just fucking, you know, poured in a bunch of goddamn gasoline or alcohol, um, and I just feel like shit, but pho is like a really beautiful thing. Those Vietnamese people got that shit right. It's, um, I don't know how, I should have Googled this beforehand. I don't know how long that dish has been a thing. I would assume hundreds, if not like maybe a thousand years or maybe older than that even. I have my laptop here, so I should actually just give it a quick Google. How old is pho? Pho was invented in the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay, so a couple hundred years. I was bugging for saying a thousand. So 1800s. So like a hundred something, 150. It was during the French colonial times. That's crazy. So that means it came out around the same time that the Bon Mi became popular too. All right, either way, pho is fucking a blessing to the culinary stage. Um, so let me get on with, with what we did. So basically my friend, Claire, I don't, I've recorded a podcast episode with her, but I don't think it's ever been released just cause I got a little bit too tipsy beforehand and, uh, we had to scrap that episode. Things kind of just went off the rails, but she's a huge fan of pho, shares the same passion than I do for it. Also believes it's the ultimate hangover cure. And it's one of those foods. It's like when you eat it. I guess the nearest thing I could compare it to is like for American people it would be like mac and cheese or some shit like that. I'm not Vietnamese, but like for American people, mac and cheese, fried chicken, Southern comfort food. It's like that, but it's like soul warming. Whenever I have a bowl of pho, 
with a little bit of sriracha, a little spice in there, some chili oil if they're really fancy. I just feel like chi has been, I guess, given to me. Like my 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 chakras have been balanced. I don't know what way to put it, but it feels fucking fantastic. It's honestly one of my favorite foods. And there's a lot of variety in pho, right? Like some... Oh, my cat's taking a shit, so sorry if you hear the, the litter rattling. There's a lot of variety in uh, in pho, right? So there's like the typical simple just slices of, uh, of beef. And then some people get a little fucking cray cray with it and get a little bit more. Um, they add in some some more some more goodies. You got like the the uh, tendon sometimes. Sometimes it's like cartilage thrown in there, there or like um, meatballs, too. So and I've even seen some places get real elaborate and they throw in a giant ass like rib like a short rib. I don't know if it's technically called a short rib, but it's just a big ass bone with a whole ass hunk of meat. And it just sits there in this beautiful broth with these perfectly textured rice noodles. And it is, I I, I just ate dinner, but my fucking mouth is literally watering right now. So Claire is a huge fan of pho. We did a lot of preliminary research going into this. And just a quick side note, if you're visiting New York City or really any major metropolitan city, but New York City specifically, because I've done this even though I'm a resident of the fucking city. I've done this multiple times. The best way to go about, I would say, if you're a foodie, is to get a group of people, right? Not too big, ideally like three, four people. And you pick out, you plan out a course, right? Through wherever, whichever area, neighborhood, or like borough that you're trying to explore. And then you go and plot out several restaurants along the way. It could be in the same vein. So like thematically, if you're trying to do Asian food, specifically, if you're trying to do like a dumpling tour, I know that's a big thing down in Chinatown. I've done that before too. Fucking lit soup dumpling smack. But in this case, we did like obviously a pho tour. So it was Vietnamese restaurants. And you just plan it out so that when you go there, right, you go in, you order yourself a bowl and split it between the three or four people. And you should leave the restaurant feeling hungry still, like actually feeling hungry, not starving, but just hungry. Reason being is because you're going to want to hit up three, four of these fucking spots. And that's exactly what we did. And it was a blast. And the best way, the best thing about it is New York City is obviously a very walkable city. So I think we did it literally perfectly right. We go, we have ourselves a nice bowl of pho. And then we went out and walked from the restaurant to the other restaurant. Even if it was like, you know, a 20, 30 minute walk, we would do it anyways, just because you're, you know, you're burning off, I guess, some calories. So it's good to, you know, be healthy, but also you're building up an appetite too. You're helping your body just digest that food quicker um, so that you're hungry for the next meal. Cause you don't, the last thing you want to do is get to a restaurant that you've been really excited. And usually the school of thought is like, you don't want to start the tour with the best restaurant or the one that you think you're going to like the most. Cause then everything else afterwards is shit, but you also don't want to end on it. Well, it's risky to end on it because then if you do that, and if you're too full, by the time you get to the restaurant, you're not going to enjoy it as much because you're, you're not, your hunger levels aren't as elevated. So you're just going to be, it's not, it's not going to hit as, as good. Right? So we went. And unfortunately, well, I mean, I don't think it's unfortunate, but for me, that pho tour that we did, we hit up three restaurants. I can't remember for the life of me what the third one's called because it's it was like a really authentic ass Vietnamese name. The first one is Hanoi House in the Lower East Side. The second, which was a block away, was Madame Vo, I believe. Um, if it's not, I'll put a correction here in the in the you know in the caption video captions. And the third, I can't remember. I'll also put that up right here for like what it's actually called. So you could go there if you so choose to do so. But these restaurants, all of them were delicious, but they were kind of like varying. So the first one was like a really authentic kind of high level, right? All of them were authentic, but <clears throat> even the name like Hanoi House, it the vibe of the restaurant was like not super traditional, but like you could tell it was authentic, but it was like elevated a bit. Madame Vo was more modern, I would say. The interior was very modernized. There were some really interesting, like, appetizers that we got. So we got a bowl of pho and an appetizer at both the places. And a banh mi, of course, uh, at least at the first stop, because banh mi's are fucking fire. And it was, it was really, really good. All the restaurants were really good. But the third, I think I, hopefully I said Madame Vo, which was the second. The third restaurant was, like, proper hole in the wall just 
not I don't want to say grub because that implies that it's not like delicious, but it's definitely not like these people are buying 100% organic ingredients. Like it's cheaper. The menu is in like the names of the items are in Vietnamese and the the clientele like they look straight up Vietnamese like either they're immigrants or their parents are immigrants and they all speak the language like that level of just embedded with the shit like hole in the wall real authentic not gritty but like you know what I'm saying like just good vibes for like if you're a real foodie trying to dive deep into this uh you know scene this food scene specifically pho right so the first stop we went in my opinion was the best one why Fuzz, uh, you know, each person has their own taste in that stuff, but I like, I prefer a broth that's not too sweet. I don't like when the broth is sweet. I like it to be like very, um, not oily, but like almost light, fragrant a little bit. And just, you could taste, it's like really at its core, just bone broth, like very meaty bone juice essence. Like that flavor profile is really what I prefer when it comes to like my pho broths. And this one was just fucking spot on with it. You know, you don't want your shit to be too watery or like not oily, but you don't want it to be so oily that you feel like you're just drinking a fucking, you know, shot of oil or whatever it is. And this one struck that balance perfectly for me. Also, the accoutrement that it was served with, they gave us a fire. I think that's the correct use of that word. They gave us a fire like homemade chili oil. And then Claire, she's been there before, right? Shout out Claire. Homegirl held it down because then she ordered bone marrow on the side. So it's just a split ass. I, maybe it's a leg bone. I don't know what it is, but it's a split bone cow bone and it's like charred delicious, right? I love bone marrow. And then we just scooped that motherfucker in and plopped it right into the bowl of pho, mixed everything up. The texture of the noodles, you want it to have a little bit of chew. You don't want it to be mush, but you don't also want it to be like firm as fuck. It's not al dente pasta, right? It's not supposed to have like a really big bite. And that's exactly how those noodles were cooked. Also, another grading criteria for me, just to preface this, meat, like the amount of meat in the pho itself, some fucking places, like I'm going to throw this place under the bus, even though I, I go there pretty frequently. Five Spice. It's a big place in Brooklyn. A lot of people consider it to be like one of the best pho's. It is a good pho. My only gripe with them is that they literally... The, it's they only put like three slices of meat, three, four slices of meat tops. And you know, these are paper thin slices. And you know, by the way, side note, that your place is legit. The pho is legit. If the beef slices are served raw, I know a lot of people are gonna freak out if you've never had pho before, but that's the way you gotta do it. The fucking heat of the broth cooks that motherfucker. That's why they're thin, like almost paper thinly sliced. Like you you should be able to get light coming through that bitch. Like it should look like a stained glass, like red stained glass. That's how thin these slices of beef should be. I'm really, I might have to fucking eat something after this. I'm literally working up an appetite just describing these goddamn bowls of pho. So we get that first bowl, right? And we split it up into all of these little, you know, mini bowls. And it's so funny because I was really... I was so excited for this food tour or pho tour for the longest time that like I was thinking about my grading criteria going into it. I was also just trying to notice every detail and I said something out loud that I guess was kind of like it was stupid sounding, but I thought it was pretty like cool. And when I was drinking the pho, we had it in a little bowl as I consumed the very last bit of that soup, right? So like I'm just going like that. I my I'm my eyes are open so and I'm the sunlight cuz it was like noon was coming in through the window and it was hitting the inside of the bowl in a way where I could just see this oil coating just gl like gliding down the inside of the bowl into like my mouth pause and it was fucking fantastic it was something out of like a like a food show like like chef's table or some shit amazing amazing stuff I had a blast that first place was fire then we headed over to Madame Vo. Continued doing the same stuff, ordered a, uh, it was an interesting, it was like a crispy rice cake, so it's pound up rice, right, rice flour, cake, topped with a couple like herbs, um, a little bit of like seasoning, and then like fresh, uh, like fresh vegetables, really, and it was really good, 
I'm not a big fan of rice cake, but highly recommend that if you go to Madame Vo. I can't remember what they call it, but it was fantastic. And the bowl of pho also was really good. We had a short rib piece, so like a big ass long piece. I'll put up all the pictures if you haven't already seen them, um, along with the uh, descriptions of each dish or what we got. And no complaints there. I will say Hanoi House slightly edged out, slightly edged out um, Madame Vo. It, it, it just beat it. And I think I think the, 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 the group of people that I was with also had that same opinion. And then the, the last stop, the last stop of the pho tour, um, that was the 30 minute walk. It was a little farther away from the two other restaurants. So that was in like proper Chinatown. Oh my God. I can't remember what the name of it is, but that third restaurant again, hole in the wall. We walked in, ordered the same, like we ordered a pho, but because of the fact that this was our last stop. And by the way, another side note here on the way there, we were, we, you know, we were walking, we weren't, we weren't quite ready to eat another meal, right. Or go to another restaurant to order more food. So we had decided collectively as a group to make a pit stop at a bar and uh, have a couple cocktails before heading off to that last place. And we did that an amazing, a really cool bar. I, I can't, I don't have any pictures of that bar, but it was a fun bar. It was an interesting bar. And, um, from there, then we just continued like the 30 minute walk over to that third restaurant. And then when we walked in, it was the perfect level of hunger where it's like, all right, I could definitely eat. And I'm hungry enough to where we could order something more than just a FUD to split between like, you know, the three, four of us. Um, so we ordered a bunch of other Vietnamese food too. Mike was there who's been on the podcast before. He was a part of this group doing that pho tour. And we had all ordered, um, it was his first time having salt and pepper shrimp. I don't think, I don't know if that's a Vietnamese dish in origin, but it's a common like Asian dish, right? He fucking thought that shit was fire. Vietnamese grilled pork chops. I don't know what they do to that shit. It has like a sweeter, not like a super sweet, but like sweet-ish glaze that they put on it. And it's it's so goddamn good. It's like mouth-watering. This this episode's really hard for me to record. My fat ass is literally, I'm not joking, my appetite is getting worked up just talking about this. It's like the third time I've said it, but it's so true. And then we ordered um we ordered some beef cubes, steak cubes with it, standard stuff. It was good, but definitely the thing that stole the show. I I really like the pho, but the pork chops, but the salt and pepper shrimp was buzzing. It was amazing. So those are the three meals that we had. Super fun time. Um, I would, I could not recommend doing some sort of food tour like that. If you're going to go to like a major city, uh, on my list to do those things with is a hundred percent going to Chicago and doing like a deep, deep dish pizza tour. I know a lot of people don't like deep dish pizza, but you know, each to each their fucking own. I, I'm a fan, even though it's basically just tomato sauce pie. So yeah, that was, that was basically the pho tour. It was a grand old time. Um, I'm probably, I, I think for whatever reason, I really love, like, I, as I'm starting to do more episodes on a consistent basis, I think I'm trying to, I don't want to find my niche, but I want to find like a regular occurring, I guess, theme of an episode and food for sure is something I'm super interested in, right? I've actually reached out to many chefs before in the past to, with, you know, to no success, just because I don't have the, uh, the audience yet to, you know, kind of get them or entice them to come on. Um, and I, and I tell them straight up, like when I DM them, I'm like, Hey, you know, my eyes, I don't got nothing to offer you, but like, if you could really come on, I'd, that'd be very much appreciated. And they usually just ghost me, but there's some really fascinating characters, especially here in New York city, uh, like young chefs who are on the rise or have a restaurant that they've, you know, poured their heart and soul into. And they're relatively young for the culinary scene, but the restaurant is, you know, for the most part, very successful. Um, so yeah, those are. Those that is like a type of episode that I definitely want to do more often just because I am very passionate about food. Uh, I, I was talking about this shout out Miguel on the last episode when we were when we were talking about food and really just going into like the deep dive between, you know, the top five restaurants we've been to the best meals of our lives, the history behind the Michelin guide and the ranking system. He really educated on me me on all of that. And while we were recording it, I just realized how much I can talk about food and how how I could talk about anything forever, right? I mean, and if I know it or if I know a little bit of it, um, I love shooting the shit with people. But something about food is just like I am – that is a subject that never gets old for me. I love watching 
food related things on YouTube too. Like out, the Outdoor Boys is a primary. I think he's he's obviously very well known. Like eight million or nine million subs recently blew up, and he is a primary. Or that man or that family pr- runs a primarily like outdoor activity based channel. But the thing that really drew me in is the way he was cooking shit in these like like legitimate camping situ- situations. It's not like you go and it's like a campground where they already have like fire pits or like, you know, like a little not level up from an outhouse. So like a little brick building where there's running water. It's not like that. He goes out into the fucking wilderness and then he brings like a Ziploc bag full of already rested dough like bread dough and he'll just cook dough like bread dough like a piece of flatbread on coals like straight up like just makes a fire take some coals and you would think it's like that's kind of gross because you're getting ash or like I guess like charcoal in your mouth but the way he explains it it kind of makes sense and it's almost like I want to try that he takes his fucking shovel puts it over the fire and uses it as a pan for that flatbread he also Sometimes it gets really fancy with it, gets a big ass honking piece of meat and just skewers it and lets it slow roast. Just little things like that. Like, I don't know why I could watch that for hours. It's like my go to nighttime routine now where to wind down, I'll put on an outdoor boys YouTube video and I'll just sit there chilling, like watching this guy just fucking be out in like the craziest of conditions with the most beautiful of views and then giving survival advice and also cooking up some fire food. I don't know. Something about it just speaks to me. So, yeah, that fun tour was super fun. Um, now to move on and talk about the one and only Tom Segura. Tom Segura was performing a comedy. I don't want to say special, but he's on tour right now. Um, he's been on tour for I think like the last like year, low key, or like year and some change. I think it's like the whole tour that he set out to do was going to be two years long, and I think this is part of it. Um, it's called the come together tour. At least that's the, that is the show that I went to. It was called like Tom Segura come together. And it was at Mohegan sun, which is a casino in Uncasville. So before I get to the actual show and my thoughts on it, and I, and I'll give honest like thoughts on it. The casino itself is an interesting place. I hold on. I fucking, your throat gets a little bit of a workout here. Pause. Um, casinos are interesting, right? You have, and this is actually a joke he did. You have such a wide variety of people. Like you have like really young people going there for the first time, trying their luck, playing some games, mostly drinking alcohol. And then you'll have like these grizzled, just gambling addicts, like these old heads that are just there. You could tell that they fucking, that's basically their second home, right? And they just play and play and play and play endlessly sitting at these tables and they just look like zombies because I doubt they sleep or eat very well and they're there all the time and I gotta wonder how are you old right and if you're retired you're no longer making an income or like a substantial income sure if you if you play your cards right of course you could have like passive income or like a good ass retirement account or whatever it is but some of these people, like, they don't look like the most responsible. Like, they look like, like, I'll just I'll just say it as it is. I saw this one woman who was in her 60s, and I looked at her lips, and I was like, yeah, you've definitely taken a hit out of a crack pipe before. Like, the way her fucking lip, they were paper thin, first of all, and she had, like, that cheap-ass red lipstick on, and her face looked like a prune. I'm not even joking. It was so wrinkled, but like not wrinkled, aging wrinkled, or you are an outdoors person. You just like to just get baked in the sun, not like sun damage wrinkled either. It was like hard drugs wrinkled. And when she came up to me and she opened her her mouth and she like asked me a question, I think we were like on a buffet line. She asked me, is that good? And I was like, did you really just sound like that? She was like, is that good? Like nasty. It, It sounded like she'd smoked Marlboro, Marl, I don't even know the fucking, whatever, fat, backwoods, I don't, I don't even know the brand of cigarettes, but it's Marlboro, oh my god, I can't say this, Marlboro Reds, Marlboro, let me think, let me look this shit up, now, because now I'm, Marlboro, 
Okay, it looks like she smoked packs of Marlboro Reds her entire life. Like, one pack every two days, at least. Because she also had that stank-ass cigarette breath, and I'm like, yo, motherfucker, I'm losing my appetite. You asking me if this is good, and I'm losing my appetite as you're freaking talking to me. So this old woman, she was there. Her man looked even worse than she did. Not to judge people, but it's like, what are you guys doing? Like, you guys really want to spend out your last remaining days doing this shit? I mean, this is probably how you got to this position to begin with. Seedy people, but then you also have people who are like, they walk, they walk around and you just know they got money because they're betting in a way where you're like, get, did you just actually bet a thousand dollars on one fucking hand of poker or like crisscross poker or one hand of blackjack? Like these people are wild and they always got like the, the brand name shirts. There's always some douchebag with like a fucking who's out of shape with like a fucking button up shirt that's buttoned up, buttoned down two or three buttons too many. And you see his like, like. Weak excuse for a chest. Not saying I'm like the most ripped guy in the world, but they got a pot belly, weak excuse for a chest, man titties, button down. It's like a silk Versace shirt, slicked grease back fucking hair, right? And that dude casually with a rolly on his wrist betting two, three thousand dollars per fucking hand. I don't understand. Like, I don't understand how this is literally, it's not like a one one guy. It's like a character of person. It's an archetype of person that's constantly at these fucking casinos. And it's interesting to, it's not like this casino specifically. I've been to a couple casinos. I've been to a casino in Atlantic City. I've been to Vegas and I've been to Mohegan. I'm not a gambler. I just happen to go to these places because I have people in my family who either like live near a casino, like in Vegas, for example, or... They go to Mohegan, for example, and they have like a membership because that's how these fuckers get you and they get you free tickets to stuff, which is actually how I ended up seeing Tom Segura. So that's a perfect segue. Um, my dad actually is the one who has the membership and he has a couple buddies there that he sees pretty frequently whenever he goes and they, they not comedy fans and I'm a huge stand-up comedy fan. So I was, I had to like secure, I, when I saw that he announced that he was performing in Uncasville, I told my dad, I'm going to need you to cop like like a bunch of tickets, like as many tickets as you can, right? Uh, we turned it into a weekend. Me and the boys went up there. I actually ended up winning a fair fair amount of money. I came back with like $375 because I just hit like a stupid jackpot thing. Straight up luck. No skill at all. It was literally just like a jackpot thing that ended up giving me $500. Um, so super happy about that. But... The show, I asked Miguel, Andy, his wife Sandra, my mom, and then Vishal to come with me into the show. All of them have been on the podcast before, by the way. So we all went into the 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 uh, the arena because it sits like 15,000 people. It's not like a small venue. It's like a big arena, 15 fucking thousand people, sold out. And something I really respect about stand-up comedians, like, you do this shit like musicians do this shit a lot. They'll tell you the show starts at 8 p.m. And this fu the main act for the show will fucking pull up at like 10. So you're just sitting in the seats for two hours, twiddling your thumbs, sitting with a thumb up your ass, just like, uh, what do I do for all this time? Like the opening act is only 30 minutes. So for the rest of the hour and a half, like you really just got us here just chilling. And I've always that's always bothered me because it's like I'm paying money to see you like in concert. At least have the decency to, like, if you knew that you're going to come out at 10, why not say the show starts at 9.30? So the opening act is on the stage by 9.30 and you come out at 10. It's not rocket science, but they always say 7 p.m. showtime. That's when it starts. You go in. I've even had an experience where I'm waiting three hours for the main artist to come out. It's ridiculous. Like, musicians are divas, but, I mean, I mean that's the price that I have to pay for to see some of these creative geniuses. Uh, in, in, in real life, so be it. But stand-up comedians, complete opposite of that. Not that they're not talented or creative geniuses in their own right, but when I went to the show at 8, I mean, we got there at 8.10 because the, the line was still feeding in, and by 8.30, it was starting already. Like, I walked into the, it was actually like, I think, 8.20. So 20 minutes after the show time was set to start, the openers were already out. First opener we saw was Josh Potter. Pretty decent. Um... Definitely, I, I've been to the Comedy Mothership in Austin, Texas, and, I, and I've been to, like, I think one or two other comedy, like, clubs, right? Not, like, arenas. 
or stadiums. And I will say that I think comedy definitely lends itself best to like smaller, more intimate environments just because like when he was talking into the microphone, the the way the voice projects through the speakers, right? There's a little bit of like a lag or delay. It's not matching. Like you're not in sync with the comedian while he's ripping off like these punchlines. So that that was like a little bit of like a barrier that I guess all those comedians had to overcome. So Josh Potter was good. I can't remember what the second opener's name was, but she was a person out of New York City. Her name, first name was Jordan, but I can't remember her last name. Um, fantastic also. Very unique style. Like, it's funny, like, Josh uh, Potter came out and his style was, it's interesting to see how different comedians, like, in real in real time, like, you'll watch these three comedians back to back to back. And the first comedian was very slow paced, more, like, used pause and timing right as like i guess the main mechanisms of delivering the punchline but the second comedian uh her name was jordan um she was like she was very like rapid like the way she was talking was just like zinger 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 storytelling 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 like very rarely did she like pause to build tension or whatever it was and this is one thing I'm realizing about myself. I'm such a fan of stand-up com- of stand-up comedy. Like when I first started watching stand-up and I when I first got into it, found like my comedians that were like or comedians that really like that I became a fan of. I I watched it for enjoyment, like pure entertainment. So I'm going there kind of just airheaded, just absorbing whatever they're telling me and letting myself laugh at these things. Now I realize because I watch so many podcasts from my favorite comedians, because I've watched so many specials now at this point, like I fucking anytime specials come out on Netflix of like a comedian that I know a little bit of or um, have heard people say good things, I'll put it on just to see like if I fuck with them or not, because I just love the art form. And it's interesting to see how like my brain has shifted where it's not so much that I'm consuming this for pure entertainment. Now I'm, I'm analyzing it a bit. Like I'm a little bit more analytical when the person is saying or speaking in the way that they're speaking. Why is it funny and how are they funniest? Like that's something super interesting that I, I it's almost, it's like, it's a good and bad thing. Good because it's cool to be able to break that down. And also like I have like a, I don't want to be a stand-up comic, but I have like a weird ass bucket list thing of at least trying to do an open mic night once just to see how I would do in that really vulnerable situation. So there's that uh, element to it, right? Because I'm just curious, like, how do these people make this shit work? And it's just fascinating. But the bad side to it is that I'm not like allowing myself to just be fully immersed in this art form. And it's very much like, I have to, I'm kind of separating myself, right, in order to look through this perspective or lens at this show, and then when a punchline is delivered, I might either be expecting it, or when they, when it, when it's delivered, I'm like, oh, okay, like, I see why he said that in that certain way, and it, it doesn't, like, it doesn't allow me to, like, laugh, like, belly laugh, like, I guess, like, I used to, so it's super interesting, um, how like my brain has kind of shifted in that way. And then when Tom came out, you know, the, the first two opening acts, I think were 15, 20 minutes each Tom comes out and does a full hour. And that shit was fantastic. Like it was honestly, it was amazing. Like the entire show, right. You know, a stand up comedy show is going like that. You're, you're witnessing a master at work when the hour flies by like that. If it's a fucking person that you're not really a fan of, like you're just not really vibing with the jokes, you know, that they're, that they're, you know, saying on stage, that shit crawls like really, really, really slow. It's just a slug fest. Like, I don't know. That's, uh, that's not the proper way to put it. It's just like, it crawls by like, like a snail, right? You start looking at the timer and you're just like, how, how long does this motherfucker got? Because I'm, I'm, I'm already like, my patience is up. Like they haven't made me chuckle. I'm a little bit annoyed right now, like shit like that. Uh, Probably not the best reaction to have, but in this case, I didn't have anything like that because I thought it was fantastic. Everybody who I was with with was dying, and I realized that one of my favorite people to see stand-up comedy with, like like, I didn't know this, obviously, because I think I've only seen like one show with her, but my mom is 
She is probably like one of the best audience members you could ask for. When when Tom was saying all of his jokes, my mom has it's like she doesn't hold anything back. Like if she finds something funny, she's fucking la- dying laughing, right? And it's not not genuine. It's just she doesn't like you know some people they'll try to like mute their laughs or they'll be they're they'll be weird about it where they just don't want to just submit themselves to just dying of laughing like I like kind of like low key me like what I just said. But my mom's the exact opposite of that. So she was just cracking up the whole time. His jokes were. It it was it's interesting because I was I was looking at his whole hour, and I really noticed that this motherfucker obviously he's he's one of the most successful standout comedians in the world, but you really realize how good someone is when the entire hour is just like gift wrapped gift wrapped as like a perfect present in one total concise package. It never felt like there was a weird gap between bits. Everything connected to everything and the sequencing of things was just felt natural and it's like, oh, okay, this, that, this, that, and it was just flowed perfectly. Another thing I noticed about him, I'm not going to say any of the bits, obviously, because that's fucked up, um, but because I, I think he's actually working on hopefully another special because he has five out on Netflix and all of them are really good. Uh, I mean, some of them are decent, but some of them are like three at least, at least three of the five are fucking fantastic. And... The way he uses pauses and his own laugh or kind of like a break in in a performance is used in a way where it's like expert it like exponentially increases like the fun vibe and also like the delivery of the joke. So for example, I'm not gonna say the bit again, but like he, if he's talking about something ridiculous, he'll say something ridiculous, like introduce a premise that's like wild. And you're just like, what the fuck? Did he just say that? Whatever. And as he's trying to explain it or as he repeats himself, he'll he'll break. Like he'll laugh himself. He'll just be like <laughs> like that, but like laughing. So the when he does that, it's like a quick like it's like a release thing, I guess, as an audience member. And then like if you when you realize that he's having fun and he recognizes how crazy, batshit crazy this is, You're, it's like it almost invites you. It pushes you to laugh. Because some comedians, they'll say some wild shit, like wild shit, and they maintain like a very serious demeanor the, the, through the entire delivery of the joke. And while they're saying that joke, the audience member is probably thinking like, there's no way this can be happening. And they're not like, in a light mood because of the fact that the the vibe that the comedian is giving off is so serious. Like they truly believe X, Y, Z, right? And you're just like, there's no way somebody can hold this opinion. Tom doesn't, with some stuff I guess he does, I can't speak for him obviously, but what I observed is there were some points where he would say something wild like that and him laughing and breaking, I guess his character, like the routine, right? It like, shows like I even recognize that this shit is wild and it's just it's perfect it it was it was amazing I really realized like there there is like an insane like now that I'm seeing a full special right or not a special but like a full really like towards the end of its perfection a full hour you you can really tell like how good that motherfucker is at stand-up comedy and I already knew it going in. Obviously, I was a huge fan fan of his, but just everything about the performance was I can't say I can't sing his praises enough. It was it was fucking fantastic. So that's the episode. Um, thanks for tuning in. If you if you watch this episode, just hearing me yap away about these things, uh, telling these little stories. I got an interesting couple episodes in the pipeline. Um, you know, so I'm super I'm very excited to record them and also release them. See if you know like. You guys fuck with it or not. Again, if you guys have made it to the to the end of the episode, before I give my usual outro, if you have any constructive feedback, like the thing with the glasses or whatever it may be, don't be afraid to like, you know, let me know. I mean, don't be a dickhead about it because some people are just wild, right? <laughs> but if you have anything good to say, not good to say, if you have anything constructive to say, I am more than open to hearing um, y'all's opinions and stuff like that how I improve and how we build a little bit of a community here 190 subscribers deep it's uh close to 200 and before we know it hopefully we'll be at a thousand and then 
so on and so forth. So yeah, it's been it's been a good time. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this solo dolo episode. Uh I'll also go into Arizona in in about 2 weeks, so we'll see how that goes. Uh I'm excited to have that West Coast Kush for the first time cuz I've never had legit like obviously I've never even been to the West Coast too. So it's going to be interesting just to see how if it's really true what they say about people there, how they're way more easygoing and like laid back as if they were constantly high 24/7. So we'll fucking see. I can't wait to to record an episode about that. And yeah, um, again, if you made it to the end, thank you for liking, subscribing, uh, sticking through this little, little shorter than usual episode. But again, I'm running out of shit to talk about here, solo dolo. So yeah, uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that social media bullshit. Cue the outro music. And until the next one, y'all. Deuces. <laughs>